in the uh, well, the plan for today is going to be have to. But my book for today's tutorial is like uh, I'll be able to explain some common terminologies because there are lots of terminologies for the geospatial data that we're working with this week. And then I would uh, show uh, how a PDL pipeline works, and then how we can you know, use it to get the data that we want based on the boundary or bounds that will be specified by uh, the user of our packet. And then I'm going to show a simple uh, visualization example as well. So how to get the data and the rest will be, uh, and, and hopefully we will be able to be deployed on the end as well. I believe you can see my screen in the in the root folder for what we have been working with. I have shared two uh, notebooks here. There's a book there. Shared two, notebook, two notebooks here. We have the technologies explanation as well as a visualized raster. So uh, these are what we are going to be using for this tutorial. I'm going to be starting with the terminology explanations. Then you can just walk along with the me okay uh if you have um, questions while i am uh, explaining i will not be able to like see the questions now so which means we have to like uh you know on mute and just ask okay okay so let's start i'm going to move my mic as close uh, to my mouth as possible so we don't have any issues all right okay so, terminologies explanation. I'm sure you are aware of, of what GeoPandas means, but GeoPandas extends the pandas. So, the GeoPandas, um, it, it extends the pandas uh, library to allow special operations on the geometric uh, type. So the goal of your pandas is to make working with geospatial data in Python easier. It combines the capabilities of pandas and shape provides uh, geospatial operations in pandas and a high level interface to multiple geometries to shape Many digital pandas um, enables you to easily do operations in Python that otherwise um, require a special database such as Postgres. So, which means you get if using your pandas, you can to work. Efficiently with uh, geospatial kind of data. Uh, we can start just uh, geo pandas this way as well as geoplot. I kind of find it hard to install geoplot. So, if you do get it to work, it's to make a lot of visualization easier. There are some uh, markets that are in geoplots that make visualization easier. Okay, so the challenge for this week says we're supposed to build uh, a packet. Yes. Okay, so are we going to install these packages on the Amazon AWS or we can use it on our local you computer? You can use it on your local computer and then if you need the AWS, you can just ask Kevin to install it for you. Okay. Okay, so um, one of the issues with geospatial data is that uh, there are lots of terminologies and uh, that are used and it's easy to misplace these terms, like I forgot them or it's not clear. So below are some of the terms that are commonly used in uh, geospatial uh, uh, kind of data. We have the shape files. The shape files are data file formats used to represent items on the map. They are a little bit detailed below. We have the geometry, which is a vector, which is like a particular column in the data frame because it we have a geometric column in the data frame that makes it a geo and that kind of data frame. So we use geometry to represent points, polygons, and other geometric shapes or location, uh, usually represented as well-known text. So a well-known text is a text markup language for representing vector geometric objects. So it's a binary equivalent uh, known as uh, a well-known binary and it is used to transfer and store same information in a more compact form, convenient for computer processing, but that is not human readable. 
So well-known text particularly is not uh, uh, easily interpreted or interpreted by uh, humans, but it's much easier for, uh, for computers to read. That is if it's in, if it is in the well-known binary. So for humans to read them, they convert them to well-known text. And it is this well-known text that um, we wrap our geometry in, and that's why we could easily read our geometry. So uh, a polygon is an area where a point is a specific location. So when we have a polygon, that's like defining probably a, a specific area in the map, where a point is pointing to a particular location on that map. So a point could be your house on the map, while a polygon could be the region of your house on the map. So a base map is like the background setting for a map, such as the borders in Germany. So you can like you can have like a base map would be probably you you you've gotten a shape map and then shape part is going to a particular region, and then that region is in a country called Germany. So you can probably you know use the base map as like the general map of Germany, and then put your shape file on that to specifically point to the region of that map. Okay. And then we have the projections, which is the since the hat is a 3D spheroid, you know, it's like the circle, then we have the height grid and the red or side grid. Then you choose a method for how an area gets flattened into a, a 2D map. So here we use uh, so coordinate references there, the CRS. Uh, and then there are a lot of them, and then they are confusing. And you must have seen examples of the EPSGs. We have uh, lots of um, different encoding techniques. And basically, what they do is just like since they had the heart is a 3D shape, we kind of find a way to make them 2D because that's what we mostly interact with on our computer, the height and width. So, for us to be able to do this, we need to like, really project them. And then that's why uh, the sort of uh, pipelines of relating data that are in 3D, you need to like project them to 2D. And then the way you project them will affect the way they will be displayed as well. Uh, we have the color map, which is on color to choose or render the plot. We have overplotting, which is uh, stacking a particular plot on another plot. We have the uh, photo split, which is uh, using different hues to um, color polygons as a way to like represent data levels. Usually, we use those in maps. I'll show you some examples. And then we have the kind of density estimation, which is like uh, a data smoothing technique that creates controls of uh, shading to represent uh, data levels. Uh, and then we have the cartograph, which you know uses the uh, the it maps the uh, relative area of the polygon to represent data levels. So depending on the kind of data level that you want to like explain, you use the uh, kind of density estimation or a cartograph. Uh, a cartogram is available in geoplots, but then I, I do not like installing, so I can't really uh, give some examples of that. We have portals, which you are familiar with from some of the past projects that you have done. So it's just bringing data into in specified values of the four sides. Then we have the heteronoid diagram, which is like dividing an area into polygons, such that each polygon has, contains exactly one generating point. Uh, every point in a given polygon is closer to its generating point than to any other point. And then this is also known as interracial desolation. And then we use this when we want to like understand our point difference in a given polygon or uh, a geometry. So this is like the uh, simple explanation of some of the common terms that you might encounter while you deal with geospatial data. But in a more uh, detailed form, well, I'm starting with the shape files, which is like what we are going to be working with mostly in this uh, project. We, uh, the AWS and the stream bucket have like they have a bunch of all of these data. They said they have like close to 300 and something billion points. And then we can't actually store all of this in a, uh, we can store all of this in a particular database. And then that's one of the reasons why we have um, created, you know, that's one of the reasons why you need to like create a package that will enable them to communicate with this uh, stored data and then extract them based on the boundary that is specified and then do some pre-processing and visualizations for them. The, the idea is as a data engineer, you don't, um, you, you don't necessarily have to understand the, the integrities that goes into each data. 
just have to understand that this is the data they want, this is the format at which they want it, and uh, this is how they are getting it. Okay, so you say everything is in the pipeline, so to say. Okay, so what are shape files? Uh, shape files, known as um, SHP, is a file extension for one of the primary file types used for um, representation of S3 shape files. It's, uh, it represents your spatial information in the form of vector data to be used by geographic information system applications. And um, the format has been developed as open specification in order to facilitate interoperability between ESRI and other uh, software products. ESRI is like an organization that deals with geospatial kind of uh, data. And then they, they, they create uh, shape files, which is like, uh, which represent particular vectors or particular points in a, in a, in a map, right? So a shape file format describes your special information of the data set as vector features. And then these vectors are the points, uh, includes lines and uh, polygons. I've explained what polygons and points mean, and the line is just like what makes putting these things together. From one point to the other, probably a line link them together, okay? So the features in combination can represent almost any type of shapes like water wells, country boundaries, spatial points, river flows, lakes. So each uh, vector feature can have the attributes that actually define the purpose of that feature. And then, for example, a shape file containing cities of Lagos can have city name and temperature as attributes, which gives meaningful representation to the spatial data. So, um, you know, for, 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 uh, if, if you have like a city name and then you have like temperature that gives that gives meaningful information about that uh, spatial data, which means like you can represent or you will be able to tell the temperature that are, uh, I mean, the, the temperature level of a particular city in a particular shape file, right? So just like, you know, in your data frame, we are going kind to of have, uh, let's say the data frame is about employee, you can have the salary of that employee. That data frame makes sense because you can then tell this employee means the social group amount of uh, salary, right? So a standalone uh, shape file cannot be used by software applications to make meaning of the data it contains. So, uh, which means that shape file does not exist alone. They have like uh, uh, subordinates. Uh, they have like let's say partners, so to say. They have partners that like they that make them function well. In order to make sense of the information contained in a shape file, your shape file uses uh, the following mandatory files, which is the SHX file. Which provides the index of the shape file, which uses the TBF file, which is the base file that stores all the attributes of the shape file and uh, of the shapes in the main file, the main file being the SHP file. And then we have the PRG, which stores the project information of the file. Particularly, the project information of the file is the projection of the file. And then the projection of the file is controlled by uh, the world, uh, the, the, the CRS here, which is like the EPSG software. Of the source, so that is uh, that is the simple information about shape files. I believe you have like concrete information of what a shape file contains and how it works. So it, when you see an a dot shp file, it probably have shx, ebf, and prj. It also has some other um, uh, data that like associate that we can associate with the shp file, but then they are not mandatory. These are mandatory. For instance, if the PRG file is not present with a SHP file, then if you like try to visualize it, then it's like uh, it will give you like some sort of uh, not accurate kind of visualization because it does not know how the I mean because that, that how you are um, visualizing it probably don't uh, don't know how it has been uh, projected like this how it was stored. So the PRG file contains the information about the projections, and then that will enable you to display. Just the way you want. To. So, for instance, if you import a SHP file into a GGIS kind of uh, application, then you get some warning that PRG files are present, so it can actually know the projections which it is coming from. Okay. Uh, then that's the shape file. We have the um, GeoJSON, which is uh, one thing that Yabba mentioned yesterday. Uh, GeoJSON is a JSON-based format designed to like represent the geographical features with their non-spatial uh, attributes. The, this format defines uh, different JSON, JavaScript object notation, 
objects and their journey um, fashion, how each uh, geometry is related. So J JSON format uh, represents a collective information about the geographic uh, features, their special extent and uh, properties. And an object of this file may indicate a geometry, which is uh, a point, a line string, a polygon, similar to SHP, then a, a feature or a collection of features. So a shape file has points, line, um, lines, polygons, but then it does not have a feature or a collection of features, and that's why um, a geodesion is kind of different from an SAP file. So the features reflect addresses and places as point streets, uh, main roads, borders as line strings, countries, provinces, and land regions as polygons. Okay. Uh, what this line is explaining is that uh, the features that are present in a GeoJSON uh, file it explains the streets, the roads, and the borders that are present in that JSON, I mean GeoJSON file, and then the line strings and the, and the countries, province, and then the regions are explained by the polygons in the GeoJSON file. So using the GeoJSON, uh, we have different mobile routing and uh, application applications that can um, indicate the coverage of their services, which means that, uh, like for instance, the Google map which uses GeoJSON to like point to um, direction, or give you directions about where you're going and then information about where you are and the rest of that. So an extension of GeoJSON is a topo.json, which is a smaller size and then it encodes geospatial uh, topology. We don't need that for this um, tutorial for, the, uh, for this project, but then it's good if you have like an awareness kind of thing for example. Uh, so in detail, the JSON can it contains coordinates, and then coordinates is the basic elements of any geographic data. Uh, it's a single dimension, which is like the longitude and the latitude, which represent a single number, a small format, and sometimes record uh, the coordinates for uh, elevations too, which is one of the things that you have been asked to calculate in this uh, project, which means that if you are calculating the, an elevation, then you would need the longitude and the latitude. Sometimes you might have the elevations with the longitude and the latitude. Most times you won't have them, and then you have to like, calculate them. So uh, the, there are this notes that I have seen that gives you um, the elevation directly. You have to like write the simple quotes that get them. Then there is a, a time dimension too, but it's complex. I mean, its complexity makes it difficult to record it as coordinates. Which means that's, I mean, that's one of the reasons why we really have coordinates having longitude and latitude. So, coordinates in both uh, JSON and GeoJSON are formatted like numbers. And from the explanation from the decimal format here, you understand what the reason why they have to be numbers. And then we have position. Uh, a, a, an ordered array of coordinates represents the position. The, the smallest unit that can indicate a point on heart is position. So the GPS that we use, you know, this is like an example of it. So we have the longitude, latitude, and the elevation. It gives you position. Okay. Uh, before the release of the current specification, which is the current geodeson that we uh, we have right now, the longitude and the latitude, uh, geodeson allowed to record three coordinates per position, but it's not allowed by the new specification, and that's one of the reasons why we have longitude and latitude and no elevation, okay? Uh, we have geometry. Geometries are simple shapes which uh, contain the points, pores, and surfaces in geodeson, which consists of a type and collection of coordinates. Point is the simplest geometry that represents a single position, and then you can have type to the point and coordinate to the zero um, display of as well. When you was opening a particular geodeson, see the type, you can have a point, it can be a multi line string or a line string or a geometry or a multi polygon or a polygon kind. And then you have the coordinates, the longitude, and then the latitude. We also have um, line strings, we have um, examples of polygons as well. I'll leave this two for you to read because we probably don't have enough time. And there are lots to cover. And so we have the digital terrain model. So a digital terrain model, sometimes called the digital elevation model, is a topographic uh, model of the bare hat that can be manipulated by computer programs. Uh, the, the data files contains the elevation data of the terrain in a digital format, which relates to a rectangular grid. 
uh, vegetation, buildings, and other cultural features are removed digitally, and then uh, leaving just the underlying terrain, which is like the bar part itself. And then the digital terrain models are used, um, especially in civil engineering and surveying, blah, blah, blah. So a digital elevation model is a 3D um, representation of the terrain and the vision found on the hard surface. They are generated from a variable space, the leader ground forms, which is a data we are working with, and they can be created using a raster grid. The digital terrain model is a DF, which uh, in which terrain data has been further enhanced with break lines, creating greater accuracy as it contains additional information defining terrain in areas where neither data alone is unable to do the job effectively. You know, leader is the kind of information that we are, I mean, data we are working with. Leader contains a lot of um, different data. One of them is the digital terrain model, mm -hmm. uh, which is you know, uh, similar to having a TIF file, a .CIF file, which is like an image. But then you see some examples very soon. So a raster consists of a series of pixels with uh, the same dimensions and shape. So this is what a raster looks like. And then in the, I mean, the, uh, in the requirements for the data you're supposed to get, I mean, you're supposed to write a particular Python probability function that would accept a uh, region, say where the, uh, the bounds are, as well as the bounds, which specifically define probably an area or a region or a particular point in the, the region that you have given. And then it's supposed to then return something similar to this, a raster array of that bound that you have specified. So a raster looks like this, where we have the um, x me. Um, we have the y max, we have the x min, and then the y min, the x max, the y min, and then we have the x max, and then y max. You see an example of all of this combined in a bound when you are like uh, specifying it. So, so I'll not talk too much of that. Uh, we have the coordinate reference system and then the projection information. So, a, a special um, reference system or coordinate reference system is a coordinate based local region. Regional and global system is to locate uh, entities. Okay. And then this is what, this is the explanation I was like, I, I don't want to read uh, all of those since we have in this book, I'll just go through it if you have questions. We can check that one more. Okay, yeah. Uh, I'll just explain it first. But the projection refers to the mathematical calculation performed to flatten the data into a 2D space. The coordinate system refers to the X and Y coordinate space that is associated with the projection used to flatten the data. So if you have the same data set save in two different projections, these two files won't line up correctly when you bring that together. So uh, a simple um, projection is the Markhan score, which is an GPS CP857. Another one is GPS 955 Another one is WTS. Another one is uh, So, uh, if this all on these four plots here, these four rasters here, they are encoded in different projections, and then you can see they have different um, uh, different plots. Like the the images are not the same thing, despite the fact that. Uh, uh, maps of the United States, but in different projections, they are all the same map, but then in different projections, and then you can see how it affects uh, the, the way they are being rendered. So um, you need to understand how your data was uh, stored in terms of the projection level and how you are projecting it to your own taste, probably because of what you want to do. That will then determine how you are projecting it. Uh, and then we'll, we should see an example of how all of this is together. Yeah, Okay, and then that is uh, that is all for coordinate reference system. If you have uh, if there are other points there that I'm not going to like read because we don't have enough time. A great resource to like understanding the different projections that exist is here, and it has been linked. You can uh, look at it and see what it's going to be. Okay, now let's talk about uh, PDAO. Uh, the, the major um, way that we can use to get the data that we want is via um, PDAO, at least for the uh, simple research that I have done. Um, using PDAO provides like an easy way to like, uh, you know, communicate with the buckets as well as get the data out of the buckets and then 
some good processing on it. Um, PDAL is short for Point Data Abstraction Library, and it's used for manipulating points cloud data, such as LIDAR. No surprises, that's what we are working on. Uh, PDAL allows users this uh, stop it from the documentation. So in case you have any other questions, you can just go to the documentation and read more. So PDAL, um, PDAL allows users to embed Python functions in line with um, other pipeline processing operations. Uh, the purpose of this capability is to allow users to write small programs and implement um, interesting actions without requiring a full C++ developer capability of building a PDAL stage to implement it. So we can use a Python filter like to interactively and iteratively prototype a data operation without strong consideration of performance and generality. It is expected that since it is written in C++, then it's considered with all of this. And one of the requirements for reading this package is RAM usage and the add uh, the, the processing power usage of the of the package that you build. Uh, if so, it sometimes um, works well enough, maybe one takes on the effort to like formalize it, but it isn't necessary. So PIDA embeds uh, Python. Um, PIDA embeds open Python allows you to be as greedy as you need to get the job done. Like it allows you to you know, just keep writing the pipeline and then it's, it's, uh, it formalizes it for you, basically. So PIDA provides a Python extension that gives users access to executing pipeline instantiations and then capturing the result as numpy arrays, which means after you like use speed out you get the data, you it returns them as a numpy array and then you find ways to like write them in the format at which you can then further analyze and then make ready for uh, your data science team or information you know, engineer to like keep the folder. So the mode of operation is useful if you uh, have and if you are looking to have PDL simply to access your data format and processing handler, which is something we are going to be using PDL to do. So a PDL pipeline, a PDL processing pipeline is represented in JSON, and then the structure uh, looks something like this. A JSON object with a key called pipeline, whose value is an array of inferred or explicit PDL stage object uh, representation, and then with a JSON array being the um, and the array being described above without being encapsulated by a JSON object. So it can either be an array that you load into your Python or it can be a JSON file that you are loading uh, from an external JSON file into your Python codes. And this is like um, similar to the kind of way we can like go into the S3 buckets and get the data that we uh, Example of a simple PDA. Um, any questions so far? Just before we get into the um, PDAL thing, although we have already started, but any questions? A lot of them. No questions. All right. Fine. We would uh, okay. So we need to write a PDAL pipeline to get the data that we need. Okay. So if uh, a pipeline defines the processing of data within PDAL, uh, they describe how point cloud data are read, processed, and written. PDAL internally constructs a pipeline to perform data. Trans and translation operations using Translate, for example. Uh, while specific applications are useful in many contexts, pipeline provides useful advantage for many workflows. So as a data engineer as well, writing pipeline is one of the things you like to almost every day. It's typically called uh, ETL. So you extract from, in this case, you are extracting from uh, S3 bucket, you are transforming in some ways, you know, adding elevation, adding uh, TWI, which is the wetness index, and then you are loading it into probably another S3 bucket, and then your analyst or scientist can go ahead and you know, use it for modeling and the rest of that. Okay, so uh, a pipeline looks something like this. You have a reader, then you have some transformation, and then you are writing it. 
So, uh, according to Abdel Pipeline, it's written in a JSON format, and then it's, it's a chunk of uh, the large array of uh, the list of uh, dictionary. The first, the first one you have here is one stage of the pipeline, so the next stage, and then the next stage, and then the next stage. So the first one is here you are reading a particular file here, and then you are reprojecting it using the filter dot projection. And then you uh, you know giving it a name here. You're also setting out I mean setting the um, output, which means you are you are, this is like what it was encoded in. This is how you are projecting it, the output source. And then this is where you are writing it. So you are right, you are using the um, writer so to doubt so like write it out. Okay, there is an example provided in the resource here that says um, reading data from EPT. Basically, when you like um, look at the structure of the uh, data that we have, when you run the command that was provided uh, by the um, AWS Open Registry, which says the um, AWS S3, and then you specify the pockets uh, location, you will get a list of uh, a large no, uh, I think it's a long format kind of uh, regions that has different regions present in the, I think it's basically for the uh, public leader in the United States. And uh, all of these specify different regions, and then each region has their own geometry and the rest of that. So in each uh, region, you can like go in depth into one and then uh, get the data that, that you need. This, uh, essentially, we'll be, read, we'll be using the readers of EPT. EPT is the entwined um, format. I think the detail is provided here. Yeah. So, entwined point style, which is like a simple and flexible octree based storage format for points cloud data. And then, when you look at it, it's probably the latest information that is provided in a particular uh, region, which means, so my understanding, it's, it's, uh, it provides like all of the information within a particular round that you specify. So it's going to like get the data based on what you specify. Okay. So an EPT JSON has this kind of information. It has the bounds, it bounds conforming the data type, which is a LASIP. Uh, LASIP is another um, data format that was that has not been explained. And then that's the hierarchy, the, the span, how it was encoded, and then the version. And then they go into detail explaining what bound means, what bounds conforming means, the data type, the bounds and the bound conforming are one of the things that you have seen here. Okay. These are uh, points or bounds, so to say. Okay. So for more detail about what the um, EPT JSON contains, you can read here. Okay. So it's expected that um, probably as like, uh, install PDAP. If you have, then you can just follow along with this. So I'm going to be explaining what this pipeline is. Reading this document should provide a little bit of information as to what it is happening here. Or in case uh, it's not very clear, I'm going to try to like explain everything. Okay. So you probably have like installed uh, PDAP. And then we're going to like uh, start now. Uh, Writing the PDL pipeline. Basically, our pipeline will be doing, we're going through all of these things. It starts, it starts from reading an EPT file, we'll specify the type, and then the file name. The file name is the location of where the file, I mean, where the file that we want to read is like, is, is, is that where the file is living, where it's stored. So we we'll specify that. Then this stage after reading it is transformation, you know, ETL, right? Extract, if you extract by reading, Want to transform right so transformation happens here the first transformation that is happening according to this pipeline is uh we have the tag which is the read data uh the aim field actually which is the uh, read uh, data uh we have the uh, no noise which is the tag and then we have the classification um the classification explains the how the data are the the idea is that uh, all the leader data that are stored in the S3 bucket, which is the API we are connecting to, uh, have been classified. They have been classified into um, 
uh, into ground levels, into uh, water levels, into different kinds of um, level. And then they have like values that specifically um, identify each of these things, right? Here, I think seven is, is, is the ground level kind of data. So if you specify classification to be uh, seven to seven, it means you are only getting the ground information for the, from this particular point. So this is one transformation. This is going to return all of it, all of the uh, class, classes that are present. Then you are saying you only want the ground level information and then you are you are using the filter that assign a driver to say you want to remove all classes that have that has not been assigned. So you are just giving them unassigned. But then this is expected to like uh, get the only ground information. But in case anything anything goes through this and it has not been classified, then you want it to be equals to zero assigned to the class zero. And then you have the projection, which is the EPSG thing we have been talking about. So we will reproject this. We give it a tag called reprojection, and then it's getting its input from the uh, we, we are naming it the uh, the white classes, and then we are using the EPSG two six nine one five as the uh, outsource, which is a projection platform. So we are reprojecting this. Note that the way you reproject it will affect the way it's been rendered when you plot it or when you use it for um, analysis. So you have to like ask specifically what uh what the analyst or scientist needs but in, in our case you can you can get all of the classes because they don't actually tell us what they i mean they told us they want to use it for flood classification I and mean, flood modeling and then uh maze plant uh, prediction so we can like get holy ground information but then atmosphere also affects plants so we want to like get all of it and then if if for that, like we want to like develop the package even more, we can provide options to specify which class of um, uh, of the data that they want. Then they can like pass this in and then we use it. So we are reprojecting it here, and then we are using the filters of um, SMRF to like groundify it to make sure that it actually belongs to the, the ground class. And then we are using um, filters dot um, range uh, uh, as well to uh, reclassify. Um, I, I can't recall what two to two uh, means, but then this is another class. I'm going to look for it. I think I have to open some, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay. But then this is used for um, another classification stage. And then we are writing in. We are writing it out. So we are done with the transformation, and we are just uh, writing it out. So we are using the writers of GDAL. You know, GDAL is another uh, uh, library, but then we are not specifically using the library now. We are just using the writers of GDAL, which helps us to write a shape file, a raster, so to say. Uh, and then we are giving it a name that uh, uh, that's Iowa .tif. We are saying everywhere where there is no data, we want to we want it to be stored here. Um, I don't have full information about what the others means. But then there are informations that helps writers to GDA works the way it's supposed to. So it outputs a TIFF file out here. And then we have the writers.last, which outputs a last file here. Um, and these are the only two um, writers that I've seen for GDA. Um, it's possible that we have more than this, but this is the only two that I've seen so far. And then this is what the this is the diagrammatic um, explanation of the pipeline. This is the pipeline by itself. This is a JSON pipeline. Here, you know, it's it's a pipeline in uh, a JSON. So we have the, 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 the only key we have is a pipeline, and then it's a long list of an array. Uh, the first being the bounds, where we specify the uh, main x, mass x, main y, max y. I have not tested with the, I have not like used the main z and the max z, but I would assume that it would work as well. Here we will specify the file name, which is where the file is being stored. In our case, it's the HTTP USGC leader public, and then this is the region name, and then this is the file that we want to get out of it. This is the latest file that has been stored in it, which contains, uh, uh, I think, all of the information that we would need to, you know, write a TIFF or a last file. Okay, and then we are using the readers.ept driver, which says we want to read it. And then we are giving this page a particular name called read data. 
this is the first stage of our pipeline. And then the next stage is the limit, uh, is, is uh, the transformation. We have the limit, which is classified into, you know, seven to seven. Uh, we are using the filters or range driver, and then we are giving it a name, no noise, okay? Each stage, right? And then we have the, the assignments, which says that uh, all, class, all data that has been restored on and don't have a, 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 any class yet, give them the class zero. And then we give the name called wipe classes, and then the type is filter.assign. If you notice, this is not like in, you don't have to like specify all of this in order to say that comes first, but the operation that you want to perform should come first. Here, this is what we are doing in this particular thing, and then we're just giving it the name and how we are doing it, right? Type specify how we are doing it, tag specify what we are doing, okay? Um, tag specify the name for this um, for this stage, and then type specify the driver that we are using to do it. And then the this is the stage for the projection, where we specify the uh, output source, and so on, raise the thing. We have question. You read last files. Uh, yes, if it does read, uh, read last files. The reader and driver reads last files. There's an example on that too for PIDA. You can check it out. But I'm sure it reads last files. Here, what you what you change it like, let's say you want to read the last file is you know, the location of the file here in the file name. The location of the file and then you know the name does last you should read it okay and then we are reprojecting it using the filters or true projection uh we are using the filters of smrf to like ground divide to make sure it belongs to the ground and then we are limiting i mean we are reclassifying using the uh the range two by two output the, the resource that provided over this definition. So I'm sure I've spoken one of these stuff. It's just started for it. And then we are giving it a name as well. And then this is our output file where we have the file name where it's been where it will uh, to store as an IOR the class. We it's getting this file file from the tag called classifier here. That's the input. And then we are giving the name itself called writers last, and then we are using the writers of last. Here we have used the uh, readers of the So here we are using the writers dot last to read. I mean to write it out. And the other writer that we are using is the uh, writers dot gda. And then we have the output size to specify the ratio I and mean, the resolution. So resolution we have the gdl ox, which is, is a tau. Yes. You want it to compress, uh, want it to deflate, and then we have the input, which is the right class last. So, from what you have written out here, just make it a T file. Basically, we are converting the last file to a T file. Okay, because last file, I mean, we have the last bit library that's like that is used to like explore last file, but then it's, uh, it's still difficult to like uh, explore because it provides a lot of non file information and then a lot of points. It's it's relatively hard to like um, compute or convert that last file to a pandas data frame. I tried it and then it shut down my system. And then my system is pretty much, I, I handle it and shut it down. So I wouldn't advise to convert the last to like a data frame because the points are relatively huge, depending on the region that you pass and then the boundary that you are you know, collected to uh, analyze. Because you need to like collect a particular data, visualize that, and then you make sure that your it actually works the way it's expected to work, right? Uh, and, and yes, that is uh, that is everything about the uh, pipeline. These are all of the stages, and then they explain in detail what uh, each stage means. So if you like go through this particular um, resource, I'm sure you get uh, a lot of uh, explanation, probably in detail, and then try to answer some of the questions that you might have. Uh, to run it, to run the JSON part, because you save this as a JSON. So to run it in the command prompt, I mean, in the terminal, you can do a uh, PDAL pipeline, then you pass in the file part, right? But then it's advised that you use the, the, the debug tag so that you can get information on the stage-by-stage -stage level, and then how it's being uh, run, like how it's, how it's running currently in the, like, the, the stage, okay? And then this will give you uh, the information that you need, and then you can like 
visualize it and then you get something like this. Okay. Uh, so that is a that is how you like get that's how you like write the pipeline and get the data out of the the AWS uh, S3 bucket to get provided. Um, I am going to try and show you how you can how you can use this particular pipeline in a yeah, in a say in a in a Python format, right? You know, as, as I've explained earlier, uh, PDAL provides uh, PDAL provides a Python extension that you can then you know write a script. That will then run this pipeline, and you know you can pass information to it directly. Okay. Uh, okay. So this is my own uh, pipeline, just like point for example. Uh, this is what it does, right? This is the starting of the pipeline. The bonds is empty. The file name is empty. As you know, the bonds specify the boundary at which I want to get, and then the file name says this is where the boundary is, right? I'm using the reader.ebt because I want to read the data. And then you know I'm classifying it. In my own classification, I'm getting information from two to seven, as well as include the nine. Uh, I should probably look, look for the classes because they the, the classes exist, but then I, I don't know where it's scope one, right? And I don't remember everything. Okay, so I'm you know classifying it here using the filters.range. And then I am reformatting it into EPSG 26915. Um, the, the input source for all of the data like that are stored in, in the S3 bucket, I think is the uh, Mercato, like the one I explained here. The one that I explained here, I think I explained Mercato somewhere, okay, maybe not. So it's stored in a Mercator format and then in Mercator as this, yeah. Okay. So the Mercator is always formatted in like 3857. So this is I, um, from my um, exploration. This is the input source for the data that are stored in the S3 bucket. And then you can like specify, say, you can specify the uh, input source here. Let's go. Let's just say, it's a key and then that the, the value which is then three eight five seven and then this specify that this is the inputs this is the outputs and then I'm this is how I'm reprojecting it using the filters or projection uh, and then these are the outputs this is where I'm writing it uh, the file name is like the output uh, the and it's getting the input from the reprojection that is happening here. And then I'm using the writers of last, as well as I'm using the writers of data, which means I'm converting basically this to a T file. Okay. Because this is input usually huge. If you get to a T file, then you can get a T file to a shape file. And then from a shape file, you can, you know, further visualize your data and, you know, exploit it even better. Okay. So this, this JSON file is called getData.json. So I have defined this. this. This I would assume that I've consulted with my, let's say I totally understand the project and this is the kind of information they want. They want, inf I mean, they want uh, data for, that belongs to classes of two to seven, as well as nine. And then they want it to be projected to this format. If you reproject it any other way, fine. Uh, because we don't have this information. So if you project it into say, you use another reprojection technique, then it's, it's fine. If they then want the specific reprojection scale, they specify and then you make changes. Or you can give them, uh, or you can just like make it more modular and then you allow them to specify the reprojection that at which they want, right? But then that might break the rules. Or you, you develop as you keep the way. Okay, so this is the um, get data of pi, which integrates with the get data of JSON. Here I'm using the PDA as well as the JSON. And uh, the public data part is the um, S3, US West, Amazon, USGS, leader public. Uh, the region that I'm using currently is the USGS LPC, this one. I got this from um, the file names that are present here. Show you. These are all of the regions that like 
present in the S3 bucket. It's a lot. I think it does about 11 top of pieces. It close? Maybe 11 also. Yeah, sorry, it's not 11. It's about 1,500 uh, different regions that are present. So I specify a particular region, and then it's of 2015. Um, looking at the EPT.json file that are, that is uh, present there, this is the, uh, the bounds that I want. I, it covers this bound that, uh, specifically. So this is the bound that I want. This is my main X, my max X, main Y, and my max Y, right? And then I you know, concatenate all of this together to make a public access path, which is like it specify this particular um, region, I mean, this particular bucket, and then the region, this one here, and then the EPT.json part, which is which will become the JSON part, and the end one. Yes, Kate, go ahead. Yeah, so um, the bounds are the bounds. How did you get the bound? The bounds. I explored the EPT.json that I want to like uh, get. So if you like open the EPT.json, you will get the bound as one of the information there. Okay. Uh, Milky asks that, uh, I'll come to you again. Milky asks, can, can we use another way to extract this function like that? Um, yes. Uh, you, you can, but, but the idea is then it's not, uh, it's not, that, that means you are like use, you are limiting the users like use um, ArcGIS to like get the data. What, what if they want different kind of data? You know, like that, 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 that's one of the reasons why they said write uh, a package that will like communicate with the um, API and get the data that it wants. ArcGIS already, I mean, it existed before this this particular program, right? So they can probably use it, but then they want a Python code to like get so that it's more dynamic and then they can get different kind of data that we want. Oh, I'm missing the point. Milton. Can you unmute and just ask? Uh, well, they have the API there, I think. I saw one of the APIs there. It's provided in the yes. Yeah. yeah, it's okay. Okay, okay. Um, I, I have not explored to that extent, so I, I, I don't know. But then there, there must be like a reason why they want uh, a, a Pythonic way or a R way to like specify it and then communicate with it. So you can probably use um, ARC. But maybe they are not using ArcGIS because it's uh, probably uh, a tool that they don't want to use in the company, maybe. Mm, it's free, but it's free. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Does it matter? Like, if it's the same data, but we don't have to process it that much because it gives us so, the already processed data, and we just have to give it the coordinates, and it will give us the uh, data that we require. I mean, I don't know how the um, the company thinks. They they want. They want a specific um, tool, and then they want a Pythonic way that's like a, a package that they can dynamically. And then Mike Hill says, ah, yes, it's not good. Okay. But then th there might be some limitations to all of these tools, right? And probably they've identified these limitations, and that's why they're not going the route of that. If you like explore the data that you get, you then get a, a, another information probably that is not provided by ArcGIS, right? Okay. okay. Uh, on the part of the pipeline code classification, okay. is it a other value for the latitude? Right? No, it's just it's just a, a, a range of values, right? It's just like you are subsetting a particular list and then you just specify the index. Basically, it's not that's the, the answer to Christian's questions. Um, he, he asked that the um, classification is the boundary value for elastic length. No, it's just like you are indexing it, so you just like specify the the, the value that you want, right? Like two to three, or two to seven, or two to nine, or one to zero. And then it asks classes. Uh, I have it opened, but I don't know where. Correct. Uh, a lot of that. I'll look for it and then send you like the, the complete thing. It's I think it's but it's classified one zero to. 31. Okay, so depending on what you want, then you can like uh, specify. Okay, Jakenda, you raise your hand earlier. Uh, yeah, I wanted to ask a question. Uh, we are supposed to 
with this pipeline, is it going to connect directly to uh, the AWS data set or we're supposed to use the, the AWS uh, S3 LS request thing to get the, the data fast and then we use the pipeline? Uh, the pipeline will connect directly to the uh, AWS S3 bucket, so you don't have to use the LS to get it. Uh, so okay, like thank you. find the absolute path to it. So once you pass the path, it goes straight to the bucket and get the data that you want. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, um, all right. So moving on with the explanation. Uh, so we have the, this bounce, like I explained earlier, this bounce as present in JPTJSON. JPTJSON con, um, contains all of the information that we need in this particular bound, right? The specific bound that it has will have all of the information that you need, and then you can like, get them. Uh, yeah, we should run those. That's what they said. And then we have the pipeline part, which is the get data of JSON. And my output file name for LAS is in a LAS uh, folder called this.lav, and then the T is the this one that you need, right? So I have a function called get raster terrain that will you, you specify the bounds as well as the region, and then it uses all of these to uh, get the data that we need. Here, I open the pipeline, which is uh, this one the get JSON here. So I opened it and then I load it into the JSON. The reason why I'm loading this is because I want to dynamically pass the bounds that have been specified by the user. And then, you know, for in the future, I would like to include the region so that you can specify the region as well. So the pipeline of the, 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 the only key that we have in the JSON pipeline is the pipeline itself. And then we subset the T0 index. Essentially, this is just subsetting, right? So the key, and then this is zero, right? And then if you do, is there, the reason why it's zero is because it's a, it's a list of um, dictionary, okay? So this this is another key, but then it's inside a list, right? So that's why we need zero, and then we'll specify bounds, and then we'll specify its value. And that's what is happening here. So we specify the key to the JSON, zero, which is like the index, and then the bounds, which is like the key, and then we specify bounds, and then we have the file name, and the file name, which will be specified here. And then we have the outputs, LAS, and then the output C. These are three and four in the stage. So this is stage uh, three. Actually, this is stage three, and then this is stage four. OK? Uh, yeah. So after specifying all of these, you make the JSON back to a JSON part. So you say feed out the pipeline. So you are making it a pipeline here. This is a Python extension. So you use feed out the pipeline and then you specify json.dumps, which dumps your JSON file, this one here. So it's ready. And then all of the empty uh, values here has been filled here. And then you can just like try it out and say pipeline.execute. Then it executes the pipeline just as you would execute it when you do feed out pipeline and then you pass in and get the other JSON because that's like terminal based and then it's not dynamic enough, it's not packaged enough, so to say that we have this Pythonic way. Okay. And then we have we handle the exception and say it's a runtime and then we get this uh, error report. Okay. Um, any questions as to how the pipeline works? Yes, Kate. Yeah, so which codes are we passing in the terminal? The pipe, pipeline.execute? We are not using anything in the terminal. Basically, you just run this script the normal way you would run it. Like you can, um, I'm not in the directory at which it was um, created. But then if you like specify, uh, You just do this. Let's wait for it. Just to type on and get data type. When you run this, when you run this, it's similar to you running the the, the pipeline itself, right? Yeah. So when you run this, then you should like get the 
link that I want, and then it will output into this folder because I've run a couple. So it will output into this folder where the teeth, and then we have so what, and then we have the last as well. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And um, for you know for further uh, like um, analysis, that's where we have the visualize of pi. But we are out of time now. Uh, I've I've already given the code to uh, visualize the pi here, which like do some uh, visualizations as to what the data is, and then how to like bring it to, to life and the the rest of that plotting the contours. And then the, the the histogram of the raster, as well as the raster file itself, showing some pathways, uh, the land the landscape basically. And then this is the simple format of the uh, visualizations. You still need to like do um, overlay visualizations, so like where you plot, uh, where you use, uh, what's it called? where you use the. You use like a base map, and then you plot the raster on that base map. That would, you know, help, help in visualizing more what the data is. So because the data is from the United States, uh, Iowa basically, or uh, so Plata River, and then we have like a map for that based on the extracted geometry. The, the geometry was extracted after the, the T file was converted to a to a shape file. Uh, to convert, according to my understanding, to convert a shape file to a, uh, I mean, to convert a T file to a shape file, I, you would extract the, the bounds, and then you just convert the bounds to geometry, and that makes it a shape file. And then that's the GeoPandas data frame, and then you can do other analysis on that, like getting the area, getting the centroids, the end, the low. All of this has their own different meanings, and then I would just like employ you to like read the documentation of GeoPandas as well to have a better understanding of that. And then basically, this is how you get started. Like the first part of the challenge says, get the data, which uh, the user supplies the boundary, and then it gets you the data. Uh, I, th I think that the codes you have here would get the data basically, and then you have the data in TIFF. You can then further, you know. Visualize it according to what has to ask. And then it asks for elevation as well. There is, a, you can easily extract elevation when you do, uh, when you interact with the longitude and the latitude of the uh, return uh, shape file. Okay. Any other um, questions? Because we are out of time. Yes, from back. Yeah, um, I have a question on the script. Can you go back to the script? Yes, I can. Yeah, from line number twenty-six to twenty-nine, I didn't really get what what you said. What what what, what is it doing there? Twenty-six to twenty-nine. 26. Okay, twenty-six to twenty-nine is basically interacting with the get JSON file that we have here. So here, I'm reading the JSON file into a file called the JSON, right? Yeah, and then. There is in the, the JSON, it's uh, initially the JSON is a JSON file, right? Here, it's a JSON yeah. file with only one key called pipeline. But then after, when you enter the pipeline, you have a list, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So in the list, we have stage of pipelines. We have stages in the pipeline. So the first stage is a dictionary, correct? Yeah, yeah. Can you see? Yeah. So because it's a dictionary, it, ha it has a key value here, which means if I go into my JSON file and then I specify pipeline, I have access to all of this. And then in the in the pipeline, I'll get a list. Because it's a list, I'll, I'll have to do a zero to get, because, you know, this is the first element in the list, right? It's here. Yeah. Everything here, yeah. So because of that, I'll have to do a zero. If I do a zero, which is like the index, I will have access to all of this, correct? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. If I have access to all of these, then I have that means I have a dictionary now. So that's why I can do bounds and then specify. And that's what I've done here. So I go into the pipeline, I specify is zero, and then I say bounds, then I specify the bounds, which means I am rewriting the values here, basically. Okay. Yes. Okay. And, all right. And that's what I've done for you know 26 to 29. Oh, okay. okay, all right. Thank you. Yeah. So, 
how we specify a non-rectangular boundaries. Uh, if if the if the EPT.json file that you are getting has that bound, as like the the specific boundary that you are specified, then it will return it. Yes, you can specify, but then it needs to be present in the EPT.json that you are returning. So the, the code only work like correctly if you like investigate what the EPT.json file contains, right? Uh, there should be like a, a, a proper way to like check the highest and the lowest bound that you can specify. And then when, when you specify something above that range, then it won't work. Okay, Daniel, does that answer your questions? Um, how did you get the file Um you, you, I just write it out and then I did some pre-processing on it. I write out, you know, when you run um, AWS S3 LS and then you specify, this is the answer to the Kinder's question. When you run um, S AWS S3 and then you specify the, the, the path, right? You and then I just write it out. You know, in, in Linux, you just do the for I mean um, greater than greater than sign, and then you just specify the, the file name. I can also like share the file names to you. I think I'll just upload the file name to you and then you can have access to it. Okay. All right. So thank you very much for uh coming and then Hopefully you have been getting also to like at least get you started and then